All right, so as people continue to come into our virtual Zoom room, we'll go ahead and get started. Hello everyone, I'm Julia, a bookseller at Politics and Prose. We're live with Roy Richard Grinker and Kay Redfield Jameson discussing Nobody's Normal, how culture created the stigma of mental illness. You can follow the link in the chat to purchase the book directly from us at Politics and Prose. If you have a question for either of our speakers, use the Q&A feature found at the bottom of your screen. We'll try to get to everyone's questions in the last portion of the discussion, though apologies in advance if we run short on time. And before we jump in, we do wanna sincerely thank you out there for joining us. We're very grateful to our family of loyal customers who keep our business and our spirits afloat. We'd also like to thank the National Capital Area Chapter of the Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance. Let's get started. For centuries, scientists and society cast moral judgments on anyone deemed mentally ill, confining many to asylums. In Nobody's Normal, anthropologist Roy Richard Grinker chronicles the progress and setbacks in the struggle against mental illness stigma. From the 18th century, through America's major wars, and into today's high-tech economy. Grinker infuses the book with the personal history of his family's four generations of involvement in psychiatry including his grandfather's analysis with Sigmund Freud, his own daughter's experience with autism, and culminating in his research on neurodiversity. Drawing on cutting edge science, historical archives, and cross-cultural research in Africa and Asia, Grinker takes readers on an international journey to discover the origins of, and variances in, our cultural response to neurodiversity. Grinkle will be in conversation with Kay Redfield Jameson, the Dalio family professor in mood disorders and a professor of psychiatry at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. She is the author of the national bestsellers, An Unquiet Mind, Night Falls Fast, and Touch with Fire, and is the co-author of the standard medical text on bipolar disorder, manic depressive illness, bipolar disorders, and recurrent depression. On behalf of Politics and Prose, please join me in welcoming Richard Grinker and Kay Redfield Jameson. Thank you both. Thank you so much, Julia. I'm honored to be speaking in, with Politics and Prose and with uh, the DBSA, the Alliance. Um, I thank you for your support. Uh, you are my local bookstore too, so uh, it means a lot to me. Uh, I'm especially honored to be here with Kay Redfield Jameson. Um, I can think of nobody else uh, that um, I could place above her as a, a writer on mental health, a magnificent writer, and um, uh, someone who's moved many people to talk about their own struggles. One of the things I talk about in Nobody's Normal is how celebrities, authors have over the past couple of decades really gained momentum in talking about mental illnesses in a way that has disarmed the stigma, that has made it more familiar and acceptable uh, to talk about something that almost everybody su suffers from at some point in their lives, some degree of emotional suffering. And Dr. Redfield Jameson was very much a part of that along with William Styron in uh, really being in the early stages at the forefront of that kind of transparency and honesty. So I'm just gonna say a few words about the book before um, I hand it over to uh, Dr. Redfield Jameson, who is going to um, ask, ask questions. Um, this is a book that is incredibly uh, meaningful to me because I weave stories of my great-grandfather, my grandfather, my father, and even my wife, who's also a psychiatrist, into uh, the narrative. I have to say that if somebody came to me and said, uh, Dr. Grinker, I'm looking for your advice on writing a book. I'm thinking of writing a book about mental illnesses, all mental illnesses, that uh, stretches from, oh, the 1600s all the way to the present and covers countries all over the world. And I'm gonna weave my family story into it too. I would probably say that that was not feasible, that that would just be too hard. And indeed it was incredibly hard to do and it took me a long time. And I was only able to do it with the help of tremendous students uh, who I have at George Washington University, graduate students, undergraduates who helped me to 
research to write sentences and craft things in a way that will reach uh, as large uh, an audience as possible and to make my argument as clear as possible. I was supposed to be a psychiatrist. Um, my grandfather and my father, I never met my great grandfather, uh, they wanted me to become a psychiatrist and I found as I was going to college that I was kind of self-sabotaging. I was getting bad grades in basic science classes. How could I be a doctor if I wasn't getting good grades? And I had a moment of insight somewhere in my freshman year in college that you know maybe I was doing this to myself so that I couldn't become uh, a doctor. So I didn't have to compete with them who I saw as giants in the field. And so I found anthropology, an amazing professor, you know, one of those charismatic professors that changes your life, uh, John Andelson at Grinnell College. And I suddenly saw that anthropology was a vehicle to understand the mind as well. Many people think that the goal of anthropology is to go to all kinds of different societies all over the world and understand them and analyze them. But in fact, that's just half of the story. Anthropology is also about going away to other societies so that you can return to your own, so you can see it in a new light. Sort of like many of you probably have noticed, you know, you go to a, a foreign country, uh, maybe you go to a European country and you notice that the cars are so small and the streets are so small and narrow and you acclimate it to it. Uh, then you come back to the United States and you say, wow, look at everything in the United States. It's so large. The cars are so large, but you couldn't gain that perspective having not gone away. And what I try to do in Nobody's Normal is to apply that anthropological perspective that I've, we go away in order to come back. We go back into history in order to come back and to see things with a fresh perspective. And when we do that as anthropologists, what we end up doing is seeing that the world that we have created isn't the only one, isn't necessarily the right one, but it is the one that we've constructed and the one that is in process of changing all the time. And the underlying message of this book, one that I think is a hopeful message, is that if culture created the stigma of mental illness, then we can change it. Then we have the capacity to change it. It's not in our nature to stigmatize others. I divide the book into three parts. Uh, the first part is very historical in which I ground the uh, history of psychiatry and the mental health professions in general within the last couple of centuries, the last 300 years or so in which psychiatry was founded as a science, in which uh, asylums were built, in which countless people were mistreated and suffered. And I look at the process from that early period of time to uh, the present, but I, I sort of end with World War I because the second part of the book is about war. And I make the argument that the growth of the mental health professions and the growth of psychiatry is not something that is gradual, but is rather characterized by short bursts of knowledge generated during wars with long periods of forgetting and sometimes regression into the past. So there's no single unilinear kind of progression here. It, it's all over the map. And then the third part of the book, I deal with the mind and body and medicalization and some of the particular aspects of the development of this concept of normal, how we got from a, a period of time where normal was something average, a statistical mathematical term meaning average to an ideal that we aspire to. And I look at how the diseases of the mind have become distinguished from the diseases of the body and what some of the negative implications are of that separation. And with that, I'll turn the uh, microphone or the stage over to uh, Kay. And thank you so much for being here. And I'm delighted to be in conversation with you. Thank you. It's really nice. It's really nice to meet you. And I enjoyed your book. I thought it was a really terrifically interesting book. Um, and I'm certainly glad to be back at Politics and Prose. I used to live about five minutes away and dropped a great deal of my income uh, at the bookstore. It's a great place. Um, 
I'm curious, you know, since the book is, I mean, threaded throughout the book, obviously it's a concept of stigma. And it's one of those things, I think if you're in sort of clinical field in psychiatry and psychology, uh, stigma is a, a word and a concept that comes up time and time again. And I'm always struck by the fact that it's a very stigmatizing word, that the word itself stigmatizes. By the time you say, say something is stigmatized, there's sort of an implication that really there's a reason why it is stigmatized. And some of us have taken to using the word discrimination instead because it's partly a civil rights issue and, and partly it's a, it's a becomes a legal issue at some point. Now, having said that, everybody uses, myself included, the word stigma just because it's, it's a useful word, but it's, it's a word that, that derives out of, I think, some fundamental um, aspect of not just human nature, but animal nature, that animals learn if, if, if you're a dolphin and a strange dolphin comes into your pod, you learn very quickly uh, to make the discrimination fast about a different language, a different uh, way of being, because you need to know that uh, for danger. And I think that's true. We all make discriminations on the basis of what we see and how we see it in terms of behavior. So I'm curious about what, what you went through in your own thinking about the concept, the word stigma. Um, Thank you. I really appreciate the question. I struggled with the word because it so often is a conversation ender. People say, well, why don't pe more people get mental health care? Why are there barriers to care? Why are people being secretive about something that they should be, we think they should be open about? And they say, well, it's stigma. And then the conversation ends. The thing I like about your comment of referring to discrimination is that one of the problems of stigma and one of the problems of it as a uh, conversation ender is that it can efface, it can mask politics, it can mask power. It can mask the fact that race and class and gender and all of these kinds of things that we now talk about, you know, through the category of intersectionality, impact the way in which a person will experience their emotional distress. And so it would be great if we could get rid of the word stigma. I sometimes think that would be great, but I don't think that's feasible. So what this book says is, wouldn't it be great if we could know the history of stigma every time we use that word. Yeah, and I think the, the fact that you embed it in so many different cultures, um, you know, and I think stigma is changing somewhat, uh, but I'm also struck that there's certain periods of time where you read literature, uh, letters between people, writers, for example, who had very bad mania, very bad depression, and they wrote about it very normally. They didn't, there wasn't the self-conscious, um, you know, diagnosing and, and so forth. It was just an acceptance as part of kind of the diversity of human nature. And I think it kind of comes and goes in terms of the human understanding. I think there's some privilege there, you know, that there were periods of time in history when, when having depression or neurasthenia, that was called that, uh, or periods of, of mania were associated with some valued aspects of the human condition for people who were elites. But if you were a, a poorer person, you were less, much less likely to be able to talk about things openly. Uh, soldiers during World War I uh, began to talk about shell shock quite openly. But uh, in, the, in the UK, soldiers who were Irish or uh, people who were uh, uh, in, involved in the war, who were say from the West Indies or from India, or if they were really lower class British, were not allowed to even use the term shell shock and had to use the more stigmatizing term of hysteria. So there's a lot of complexity and variation, you know, again, related to things like class and ethnicity and whether you were a colonial subject or not. I think that one of the things when you mentioned World War One, you, you mentioned briefly uh, W.H.R. Rivers, who of course was one of the great psychiatrists in, in the First World War. Uh, and he, of course, was an anthropologist. Uh, he was many things. He was a psychologist, right. psychiatrist, neurologist, and anthropologist. But his basic 
I, I think his identification before the war very much was as anthropologists and, and that whole line of combining, like you do interest in medicine and anthropology, you know, the, the whole Harvard group of Paul Farmer and uh, Arthur Kleinman and so forth, the, the people who've, who've combined those fields and I think made enormous contributions because they look at psychiatry very differently. Yeah, they look at it critically, but I have to tell you that like the names you've just mentioned, like Paul Farmer, Jim Kim, Arthur Kleinman, these are people that I went to graduate school with. Um, at the time that we were beginning to be trained, doing work that was geared toward ameliorating a problem in the world was kind of stigmatized itself within anthropology um, as what was called applied anthropology. Now today, you know, we've made incredible strides in not separating ivory tower anthropology from uh, the anthropology that is involved with doing you know, great work to help improve sanitation or help provide barrier, uh, break down barriers to care. Uh, but at the time, it was really, really, really tough. Um, and so the, this group of scholars really could only be very, very critical of the medical and the mental health professions. It was a it was a interesting time. Yeah, no, it's well, it's a fascinating field. So, wh why? How do you see yourself combining anthropology and kind of psychological and psychiatric interests? Well, I got involved in doing um, psychological anthropology uh, in part because I wanted to do something psychological, but not be a doctor. In part because I had a psychological anthropologist at Harvard. It's one of my main advisors, Robert Levine. Um, but I didn't do that much psychological work. I worked in, with hunter-gatherers in Central Africa. I worked on North-South Korean relations. But it was in 1994, uh, when my daughter was diagnosed with autism, that I started to think more about what anthropology might have to offer for the study of, it, of, of mental illnesses or developmental disabilities in general. I mean, at the time, 1994, so many people said, hey, Richard, you know, you're a dad of a girl with autism, but you also are an anthropologist. What do they, what do, they do with autism in Namibia? How do, what's the prevalence of autism in Bolivia? Um, what do they think about causes autism in Japan? And I didn't know, but I figured somebody did. And I started to do research and realized that almost everything we knew about autism came from Northern Europe and North America. And so that's how I got into it. It was really through the personal level. And that's how I've been writing over the past um, decade or so or more, which is to try to weave in the personal and the professional, um, e even at the risk of being seen as, you know, quote unquote, subjective, not objective. Yes, yeah, so that's an interesting concept, isn't it? That, that that you're if you're subjective that you can't be objective and that somehow objectivity is is separated from some yeah, it's subjectivity. Almost like, it's almost like if you write about it you're just you're writing about it from the perspective of a parent and that's what defines you and i think that people with disabilities um and um and mental illnesses who write about mental illnesses or who write about disability or who write actually who write about anything um, often find that their rhetoricity, their ability to speak about other things is taken away. So, you know, somebody with schizophrenia makes a painting and the art critic looks at the painting to find evidence of the schizophrenia as opposed to looking at the painting in other, other ways as if somehow that, that condition of schizophrenia completely, wholly constitutes that person and their products. And so like, that's part of the stigma of mental illness. Um, so what, out of your readings and studies of autism, kind of on the basis of your daughter, what did you end up thinking about it from the worldwide perspective? I mean, the differences and the similarities across countries and cultures. Well, I, I really um, gained an appreciation for how far we've come um, because there are people with autism in 
Korea, in China, in parts of Africa who are really suffering tremendously and don't have early intervention and they don't have a diagnosis. And if they don't have a diagnosis of something, you know, there's no, no treatment to be driven there, uh, no special education. And I was really struck um, in doing research in South Korea, about 2% when I started working there, uh, uh, which is in 2008, 2010 or so, um, on autism prevalence, about 2% of kids in the, um, their public schools have some kind of special education service. You know, extra time on an exam to you know, more intense um, involved services. Whereas in the United States and the UK at exactly the same time, we were at 13 or 14%. Mm -hmm. Now 13 or 14% of kids in the public schools are getting some kind of accommodation for some kind of special need, I thought, we must be doing something right. We must be doing something that is providing care or else you know, we wouldn't be giving that at all. And so I started to look at how the concept of autism had changed over time. And I think we could do the same with many, many other kinds of conditions as well. My college students are quite open with me about Tourette's syndrome or ADHD or autism or bipolar disorder. And I wanted to trace the historical process of this in this book to say, if we're doing something right, what are the factors that led us here and how can we stay the course? Yeah, you know, no, I think I think that's very interesting. I, and I think some of it too is it gets into the your issue of, of normal and autism, and then that whole implied spectrum, uh, which is controversial depending on where you say something's normal and something's not normal. But I, I'm, I'm just curious to what you think about the idea of the autism spectrum and at what point it shades very much into being quote normal. Well, what I would like to say is that I support, I'm really a fan of the idea of the spectrum in general for whatever it is, bipolar spectrum, depression, depression spectrum, autism spectrum, because a spectrum gets us away from the old way of viewing mental illnesses as categorical. You either have it or you don't. And when we see something on the spectrum, we gain a greater appreciation for the varieties of experience and the varieties of suffering, but we also gain an appreciation for how people change over time. That's the great thing about the spectrum. Now, there are um, issues, of course, with the spectrum, like a color spectrum. You know, do we know where yellow becomes orange or where orange becomes red? That's a judgment call that we make based on the degree to which somebody is suffering and impaired and needs help. There is always going to be a difficult judgment to make about where we move from sadness to depression, if we're talking about a depression spectrum, or where we move from shyness to autism when we're talking about an autism spectrum. But the bottom line is that the spectrum helps us understand that we all exist on continua. The spectrum is an invitation to us to join into a world of humanity in which abnormality and normality, abnormal and normal are lands that no one ever truly inhabits. And you talk about language and I know you're interested in the language of mental illness. And so you've got language like mental illness in, which is on itself a spectrum. I think in this day and age, people very much want to perhaps prettify or normalize or whatever the language so that a, a one end of the continuum is, is the concept in the words uh, mental health disorder. Now this is a fascinating concept to me. I have no idea what that means, but you hear it all the time now, mental health disorder. Um, why, where does mental illness begin? Mental health disorder begin? I mean, these are, it's, it's partly our field stigmatizes itself in many respects by being so imprecise. So if, if I say illness and I have an inclination, I work in a hospital, uh, I teach, treat severe illnesses, I, my tendency is to use the word illness because that's, that's what I see, but it's illness disorder. Um, so how do, you, how do you make sense of all that? I prefer the term mental illness because, um, you know, the National Institute of Mental Health 
studies, researches, uh, treats illnesses. You know, to try to get to health, but they're treating illnesses. Now all the other institutes, at the, almost all the other institutes are named for diseases. National Cancer Institute, National Institute for Allergy and Infectious Diseases. But then we have the National Institute for Mental Health as if we can't bring ourselves to say mental illness as if it's too frightening, right? Yeah. So this is what I think what you're saying, Kay, about sort of stigmatizing itself. Um, but let me say that I also don't like the word disorder because I think that it resonates and reaffirms uh, all of the uh, terms that people have used to demean mental illnesses, a screw loose, cracking up, um, going nuts or you know, whatever it might be. Um, one can short of a six pack, whatever the expression might be. And, and, and those are all images of disorder. And what does an ordered mind or disordered mind look like? So I prefer illness. The other thing is Arthur Kleinman, who you mentioned earlier, he likes illness because he says illness really reflects the facets of, of a person's life, all the things that happen to them when they have an illness, including their social relationships. Um, whereas disorder is kind of the technician's lens. Yeah, it's a, it's a very odd word. I mean, disorder actually, it's a sort of yeah. nebulous uh, in, in many respects. Um, so what, when you look at what you've done and, and the book's finished and it's out and so forth, what, what do you hope people get from it? Well, I hope that people um, understand that we can never give up, uh, that helping people with mental illnesses is always going to be a struggle uh, because they have a double illness. You know, they have the illness itself, which should be enough to suffer from, but then they have society's negative judgments. And we're always going to have to be vigilant because, you know, it may be in our nature, as you pointed out earlier, for us to be on guard for things that frighten us. But it is not in our nature to demean people and to shame them for the rest of their lives and to be secretive about it. Um, that's, that's from our culture. So I want people to really see that we can move forward but there are all these places where we can move back. The other thing I want people to see is that the increasing focus on the brain in research, while it may be producing some fascinating scientific results, number one, hasn't yet translated into uh, treatments. And um, the focus on the brain and seeing mental illnesses as brain disorders has actually in some places exacerbated stigma rather than reduced it. And that when we think about mental illness, we shouldn't think solely of a brain disorder, but we should think of a person as somebody who is a full, complex person in their context, in their history, in their society, with their family, their jobs, their education, their genes, their environment, all of those things, so that we don't try to, to reduce emotional suffering to some little prop, some problem in, in one organ. I, I agree with you up to a point, but I also say that, A, I think neuroscience is leaping along really fast and it is beginning to get to the point where it's translating into treatments. Uh, but I also think that at least most of the scientists that I know who study the brain and who study illnesses, in my, my case, uh, depression and bipolar illness, um, I think most of them who are clinicians have a very broad understanding of how complicated it is. Um, I think it's people who don't work day in and day out with people who have these illnesses that tend to get these very reductionist uh, views. I mean, it's certainly something you have to guard against. Um, but, and, and I agree that, you know, I think we don't give credit enough to people that are kind and understanding about these illnesses as well. I mean, I when I decided to go public about my, um, bipolar illness, which is very psychotic when I was up with it. And I knew I was going to get a certain amount of flack. Uh, one of my colleagues in England said, you know, um, I think what you'll find is a certain number of people are going to be really cruel and unkind, but most people will be far, far kinder than you would ever imagine. 
And actually that turned out to be true. Most people, I mean, there's, <laughs> there's certainly some people that weren't so kind, but for the most part, people have been remarkably kind. And I think there is that aspect, as you say, in human nature that isn't just discriminating and, and you know, judgmental, but is much more um, willing and by nature reaching out to suffering. Um, yeah, you know, I have a whole chapter in the book about Nepal. And one of the things that scientists there and, and particularly um, Brandon Court, who is a, a researcher uh, and psychiatrist and anthropologist at George Washington University um, have found is that when a person's um, emotional suffering uh, is characterized by a, a prof by a clinician, by a provider um, in the places in Nepal in which they work, as a brain problem, as a problem with one's brain, people tend to be afraid of them. Mm -hmm. They see them as damaged. Um, but if you see a person who is sick because they've experienced extraordinary stress and ex that extraordinary stress has helped, has facilitated them to be experiencing uh, all sorts of different symptoms, if they, they switch their discourse from the brain to the mind and the heart, then you see stigma decrease. Then you see greater, greater openness. Um, Nancy Andreassen, very well-respected, famous um, psychiatrist from University of Iowa, long ago advocated that mental illnesses should be called a broken brain. You know, if you broke your leg, you wouldn't stay at home and for a year and a half before you saw a doctor, you'd go right away to a doctor. But the average time from first psychosis to uh, care for that psychotic um, experience is in the United States is 74 weeks. Why is that the case? So I, it makes sense, right? To try to see things as brain disorders. But what it doesn't necessarily do is change widespread public attitudes to be more empathic and understanding about those people because it's locating the problem in, as, a, as a medical one rather than as one that is um, experience in general. It's locating the problem in the individual as opposed to in the social matrix in which that individual is living. Well, I think, I think you've written a fascinating book and I think we're supposed to open this up to questions. Ah, great, okay. All right, that's my cue. Thank you both for your discussion. Um, we do have folks writing in questions if we wanna launch in. Um, if you have a question out there in the audience, go ahead and use the Q&A feature and we'll start asking um, Dr. Grinker and Dr. Jameson your questions. Um, to get us started, it looks like Evan Harvey asks, have we retroactively done any historical figures as autistic or bipolar? And how does that help us better understand the historic record? Well, you know, I think that um, I'm not a clinician, but I would venture to say that the uh, that a good clinician probably isn't going to diagnose somebody that they haven't interacted with, that they haven't evaluated very carefully. Um, having said that, we can find in the historical record all kinds of evidence of people who had symptoms that might fit what we would today say could be possibly a symptom of autism or mania or schizophrenia or you know, an eating disorder or, 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 or whatever. And we certainly see that um, with autism. Uh, you know, we diagnose uh, autism in this country uh, so much more than we ever did because it's such an enormous spectrum. I mean, kind of going back to something Kay said, the difference between the person with autism and without autism is shrinking um, in terms of clinical characteristics. Um, but we can find autism in the past. We can find autism um, in medical records where they didn't call them autistic, but called them something else, absolutely. I don't know if Kay, you wanna chime in there. Well, certainly it's, it's a, you know, kind of an ancient uh, medical psychological uh, parlor game and in a way is going back and diagnosing the dead. You certainly don't want to diagnose somebody who's living, uh, but there, there are a lot of ways that you can go through medical records. You can get, go through correspondence. You can go through 
uh, things that have been written by by the, their doctors and so forth. And so that's been I've done a lot for mood disorders and for schizophrenia. Uh, and but you obviously want to back that up with a lot of other kinds of studies, which namely. Uh, large scale studies of uh, living artists and writers and, and so forth. And, and there are probably 150 or 200 studies now of uh, uh, mood disorders and creativity, for example. And that's, that's a place where most of the studies are living people, but some of the studies are on individual case studies of uh, individuals. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that. Um, it looks like I'm um, speaking of using the term spectrum, Donna Foss, um, how long have we been using the concept of spectrum in the field of mental health? Uh, what's some of the history behind that? Oh, I mean, I'm sure it goes way, way back before it ever got into the DSM. But, you know, back in the 70s, um, researchers in England working on autism were talking about a spectrum and, and advocating that. Um, I, I think that what we've seen is the biggest shift taking place in 2013 with the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders 5, in which um, spectrum now has become a way of conceiving of mental illnesses um, in many different areas. So it's not just the autism spectrum, but I do think that um, autistic self-advocates and autism researchers like Judith Gould and Lorna Wing in England um, really did kind of pave the way for us to start uh, questioning that categorical, either you have it or you don't have it um, mm -hmm. view. I think the danger in the spectrum is to think that being somewhere on a spectrum means you have a mental illness, right? Mental illness is that point at which something becomes unbearable or is difficult or needs treatment or you're impaired in your work life, in your, your home life, in, in your sleeping and your eating and so on. Um, but the reality is that most Americans will at some point in their lives have a mental illness and they'll be somewhere on that, that spectrum, but they can move along. Um, so, Jumping off of that, Marina has a question. Do you consider psychiatry to be an imprecise science? Or maybe I would add maybe an always developing science or is it more developed in some areas and other places we're still growing in research as you have writing this book? Yeah, I think it's a really, really um, great question, Marina. Um, I, I wanna answer it by saying that the non-psychiatric medical sciences are much less precise than we think they are. And that when psychiatry has a goal of becoming like the other medical professions, they are chasing an illusion. There is no number in nature for hypertension. It's what people tell us they've decided on and it moves all the time. There is no certain number of steps you should walk every day or number of calories you should eat, or alcoholic beverages you should have. These are things that are by consensus. And so we often think that psychiatry is imprecise because we can't find always a biomarker. You know, you can't find that, you can't see it under a microscope, right? You can't do a lab test and have it come back and say, oh, you have depression. But that's not because the mental health professions haven't made progress. It's because the brain is a totally different kind of thing than anything else. It's complex, really, really, really complex. And a lot of the treatments are kind of, you know, blunt in the sense that they are imprecise. I mean, let's take something like electroconvulsive therapy. It's incredibly effective for people with treatment resistant depression, um, but it is kind of a blunt instrument. And that bluntness scares people sometimes. But it works. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Andrew Solomon calls it wondrous. Dick Cavett called it a magic wand. Um, but here is a therapy that acts directly on the brain and is one of the most frightening 
therapies to people. And yet the hero in emergency room dramas is an electric jolt to the heart that brings people back to life. But the brain is different in, I mean, in the sense that we give it a different symbolic value. Yeah. Along those lines, a question from Nicole that folks are interested in, for both of you, how would you define the word normal? You could say a cinnamon, synonym would be usual. However, I've never come across someone who's been able to define the word normal. Therefore, it's led me to believe that normal does not exist. It's my humble opinion that the word be removed from the dictionary and the English language. <laughs> you know, when uh, people like Galton use the word normal and People use the word normal up to the 1940s, 1950s, to just to mean a statistical average, even mediocre. If you were normal, you were like average. Normal schools, remember that? We have, there probably still are normal schools. They teach the average beliefs and average values of society. Uh, but it's only in the 1940s or 50s that normal shifts from being a mathematical term to something that is an ideal. So the, what, nor what normal means now is ideal, right? Mm. And, mm -hmm. and once ideals shift based on time, based on perspective, based on who you are. And there are these, I, I tell the story and nobody's normal about these two um, people in the forties. Uh, one was a, a, a doctor and the other was an artist. And they made, they took all the statistical measurements of the average of all these body parts in the United States. Of course, only white men though, and white women. <laughs> And they like the average length of the fingers and the average length circumference of the head and so on. And they made two statues out of alabaster that they called Norma and Norm Man. And they were on display at museums throughout the country and at the American Museum of Natural History. And you're supposed to look at this and say, and they, they were advertisers, the normal human being. But what was that normal human being? It was the normal physical characteristics of a white person. And a few years later at Harvard University, researchers got a huge amount of money from the W.T. Grant Foundation to characterize the normal American person. And what did they do? They studied hundreds of people, all Harvard male freshmen. And that became the normal man in their study. So go figure. Mm -hmm. um I'd like to try and answer two questions that are sort of along the same lines. Um, they're both having to do with culture and stigma. Mary Beth writes, um, thanks for the interesting conversation. If culture creates stigma, what interventions do you propose to facilitate a shift in culture? And then we have an anonymous attendee written in. Um, or rather, Steve has written in, is it possible that while stigma may not be a product of human nature, it may be a product of, quote, culture, that is, humans will always differentiate themselves from the other. Um, is there ever a positive stigma? Yeah, no, uh, stigma is a, is, a, is a negative term, uh, completely a negative term, because it is, you know, comes from the ancient Greek stigmata, uh, which mm -hmm, was yeah. uh, a branding on the flesh. And then subsequently, uh, late, later, as you're, you're suggesting in, in your gesticulation there, that it became the Christ's crucifixion wounds. Um, but yes, if culture creates stigma, then we can change it. And what can we do? Well, one thing we can do is we can talk about it, like Kay Redfield Jameson wrote about it in her books. If uh, we are, um, if you're a student in a class and uh, you stand up in the beginning of class and say, I have Tourette's syndrome, and I might say something that is gonna make you freak out, but please understand I have a condition called Tourette's disorder, that takes away the stigma. So speaking about it, talking about it, removes the stigma. One of the advantages of the spectrum is that if we say, oh, I'm a little autistic or a little OCD or I'm a little whatever, that um, it disarms the power of those words to hurt. I, th I think another aspect of uh, one of the things that you can do to try and change stigmas, I mean, we know from the history of diseases, for example, with epilepsy, that it was a highly stigmatized disease until it was treatable. 
uh, because it was unpredictable and frightening to people and people didn't know how to conceptualize it. When it was treatable, uh, it lost a great deal of its stigma. Likewise with cancer in the 1950s when you couldn't say cancer, the word cancer. When, treat, when it, tra cancer no longer was a necessary death sentence uh, because of treatments, uh, the stigma around cancer went down. Likewise with AIDS, when AIDS was necessarily, you, know, you were going to die because you had AIDS, uh, it was highly stigmatized with disease. And then when it became treatable and people could live with the illness, the stigma went way down. And I think that that's been true with mental illness. And you can almost date when people began to be aware that there were effective treatments for mental illness, that some of the stigma began to go. So I think that uh, you know, research and treatment are probably um, among the most effective things in, in destigmatizing mental illness. It's not gonna, you know, there's obviously a huge, huge way to go, but treatment uh, does, does have an impact. Well, a lot of what you're saying is particularly true for the United States, but it's not necessarily true in other parts of the world. Epilepsy remains one of the most frightening and stigmatizing uh, conditions in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, despite the fact that there are treatments and people get treated for it. Um, and so, you know, I totally get what you're saying. You know, I, even when I was growing up, if somebody died of cancer, the obituary would say, you know, he died of a long illness or something. And they would never even say cancer, it was whispered. Um, but when it comes to um, mental illnesses, um, and other kinds of conditions throughout the world, if we look at it through a cross-cultural perspective, we see that every society has the ability to brand somebody for the rest of their life, even for an illness that they had and recovered from. And it's, it, that's, that's something we need to address. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. A few people are also interested, maybe going back to what you mentioned about turning the lens, who is doing the research, who is doing the diagnosing. And we have an anonymous attendee who writes, they found that mental health treatment can, and those who do it can be some of the worst in terms of stigmatizing people with mental health issues, in terms of minimizing their concerns or just not believing them because they have mental health issues. Um, how can this change? It seems it hasn't changed since the Rosenhan experiment. And then Gilda writes in that recently an article in their local paper published about a facility for children with intellectual disabilities and on the spectrum who were being abused. What are your thoughts on these facilities? And since we've found out in the new media age, this has happened in many other, unfortunately. Yeah, you know, unfortunately, Unfortunately, there are abuses and there are bad clinicians and there are, uh, um, there is discrimination. I mean, we see this in some of the projects that I've worked on and I'm working on now with autism where uh, uh, the average age of diagnosis of autism for African-American children is significantly later than that for their white counterparts. Meaning that African-American children uh, in these places that where we've been studying, which are major U.S. cities on the East Coast, are put at a disadvantage because they are not um, given the interventions and the help early enough. And they may be even harmed by the kinds of interventions that are given for them under uh, other labels like conduct disorder. We know that uh, the history of the mental health professions has been characterized by uh, a lot of misdiagnosis of schizophrenia among African-American men when they actually have depression. Um, so the problem isn't just that we need to get people who are mentally ill to get mental health care. The problem is that A, it's hard to get mental health care and B, it's hard to get good mental health care. But you know, this is a problem also uh, within other medical specialties too. Um, I think maybe what um, the call, the um, writer may have been thinking about is the Judge Rottenberg Center in New York, where children were given um, electric shocks to condition their behavior. Um, and that's, you know, that's appalling. Um, 
Do you, this is a question from Donna. Do you have thoughts and recommendations about talking to younger people, maybe middle school age about mental illness? Sometimes younger people seem to latch onto this term, which they discover maybe through the internet as part of their identity and parents seem to have fears about how this will impact the child's sense of self. Yeah, well, this is obviously a case by case, you know, a, a decision for people. But I have to tell you, when we started using autism with our daughter, um, she took ownership of it and she started to think about it and use it in ways that helped her make sense of herself. And I tell the story in the book about her giving um, a, a speech once, uh, a graduation speech, and people were giggling and uh, a, a little bit at the beginning, not quite understanding. And then she, when she said, um, people with autism like me, the audience quieted down and she eventually got a standing ovation. Why? Because there was a non-stigmatized framework there that they could use to understand her. And I also tell the story of a student who came to me and said that, or she told the class actually, that the best day of her freshman year was when she was diagnosed with ADHD. Well, how could that be? Well, her parents would not let her get treated for ADHD. They told her she was lazy and wasn't working hard enough. And it was only when she got to college that she took the initiative on her own to go and get some care that she for the first time felt that somebody saw her as other than lazy or stupid and that she just needed a little help. So I say, take ownership of these terms, talk about it. And you know, last one is the Rodney. I mean, you have, we, I, I really applaud parents who um, have helped their children advocate. I mean, the real heroes for me are those students that are just right out there talking about it or celebrities, David Letterman, Lady Gaga, Prince William, K. Redfield Jameson. Probably the first time your name is said. Is said was. Company. Uh, I think, I think those, those things are absolutely true. Um, I, I think also that education, just straightforward education can be very helpful. One of my colleagues at Johns Hopkins, uh, Dr. Karen Schwartz, has a program that's all across the country now and actually international that just takes a program about depression and teaches the symptoms of depression, uh, how important, how treatable it is, how important it is to get treated early, uh, how important it is to keep a wing out for your, you know, your fellow students. But she teaches the teachers and the parents and the students in a just a very straightforward way, a, a very clinical way about depression. And I think this is exactly, and she doesn't go in and talk about suicide and suicide prevention. She just goes in and talks about the illness that's most associated with suicide. And, um, you know, it's been a very effective program. And I think it's just because it's very straightforward. Kids are very interested in it. It's not like kids are um, unaware of uh, mental distress, to say the least. I spent a lot of my time on college campuses because the age of onset of bipolar was as young. And, you know, kids are really remarkably um, courageous, interested, uh, interested in learning. Uh, and, you know, it's, I think we sell students short uh, by not giving them access to information. That's a great point, Kay. I mean, I can't remember how many times I would say when my daughter was in third grade or fourth grade that I thought the, t the, the kids were so much more empathic and understanding than the teachers. Yeah. And sometimes in the parents, I mean, I think parents, I mean, I'm, I'm struck a lot by the number of parents who have bipolar illness, which is highly genetic illness, running, you know, and it, not telling their kids when they go off to college, they go off and they check the libraries, they check the teachers, they check, you know, the acceptance rates at medical school and so forth. What they don't check is the mental health facilities. They don't tell their kids, you know, it's unlikely you're going to get this illness. But if you do, it's treatable, really important to get somebody who knows what they're talking about. Um, here's a list of names, you know, just being direct and straightforward. Uh, there's a sense that, you know, if you plant the idea of an illness in somebody's mind, they're gonna get it. Uh, and I think that parents really just, you know, they learn about these Mondo Bizarro diseases that nobody gets, and they don't tell kids about depression, which they're actually reasonably likely to get. Thank you both.
for that. Um, maybe a few last questions for us to chew on on this idea of ownership. And we have a user by Polaris who writes on stigma and identity. How can we use neurotypes as opposed to diagnoses to identify with our neurodivergence? I have bipolar disorder and I don't think I should feel shame or stigma for it. Is it wrong that I think it makes me me? And then we also have writer Gil who asks um, images perception and neither has dramatically changed regarding bipolar disorder or mania or diagnoses. Can't we change the language um, like a resloganing to make even an educated public um, to soften or humanize talking about these conditions? Um, so as you mentioned before, some of those, some of these words have been around for a very long time. Um, should we should we consider changing things um, so perception changes? Yeah, let me tell you, um, uh, there's a section in, in the book in which I talk about um, schizophrenia in Japan and uh, just such a stigmatized uh, diagnosis. And the word for schizophrenia in Japanese used to be um, a word that was pretty much a literal translation of the word schizophrenia split mind, but worse. It really meant sort of a mind shattered, a mind torn asunder. And so not only did people with schizophrenia suffer from schizophrenia, but their doctors wouldn't tell them the diagnosis and they wouldn't tell the family the diagnosis. And patient advocates and some very caring mental health professionals got together and lobbied the Japanese equivalent of the American Psychiatric Association to change the name. And they changed it to something that was more vague uh, called integration disorder and or coherence disorder, and which is kind of paradoxical. And um, after a period of about a decade, the number of people who were told that they had schizophrenia and who therefore got treated better, the number of families that were told increased dramatically because now there was a word that didn't frighten people so much. I mean, it's a really good example. Language does a lot. Why do we not have the word Asperger's today anymore in the DSM? Well, because we needed that word back then when there was no uh, non-stigmatized word for people with autism who didn't have a language delay. But it did its job. We built the spectrum. We now don't stigmatize autism enough. I mean, as much, please. Um, <laughs> sorry for that misstep. We don't, and, uh, and so we don't need Asperger's anymore and we got rid of it. And we're just with autism. So these words really, really do matter. I tell the story at the very end of the book of Hester Prynne in the Scarlet Letter that uh, she comes back and, and she, after many, many years of exile, and she wears that egg as a matter of pride. She wants to keep it. Um, she wants to own it. She wants to change it and shape it and define it herself. <laughs> Thank you both for this amazing discussion. I think we are at the end of our time. We could easily discuss this amazing book for another hour or two. Um, for now, I will encourage everyone to the link in the chat to purchase their copy of Nobody's Normal have some signed copies on our shelves at Politics and Prose. We want to thank again Rich Redfield Jameson and the National Capital Area Chapter of the Division and Bipolar Support Alliance. Of course, we want to thank you out there, our audience, for engaging your patriotic enable us to host these, these events, able to do it without the book sales to support them. So go ahead and get your copy of Nobody's Normal. Uh, go ahead and visit if you'd like to access the of our events calendar for the month and ongoing. And from all of us here at and Pros, we hope you're out there staying strong, staying safe, and staying well-read. Um, thanks again to you both. We'll see everybody out there this time. <laughs>